Welcome to another episode of the Love to Move podcast, where we take a look at the word move and all of its glorious definitions and tell you why we love it. On today's episode, we have Kayla Barnes. Now, Kayla and I have known each other for a while now, and she has a passion for movement. But on top of that, she has a passion for diet and helping women understand their relationship with their food. Now, this may seem like another episode because there are several coming up about intuitive eating. But this episode, we really hone in on this idea of binging. I think that Kayla presents a really good argument about how certain programs and certain ideas and mindsets around food can really lead us down a slippery slope to where we don't have a good relationship with our food. Kayla talks to us about diet culture in general, but also her journey on going down that rabbit hole towards binge eating and her recovery from that process. I think that is very important for us to learn these little bits and pieces. We also talk about a back surgery that she had at 16 of all ages. Many interesting things to be gained from this episode. So I do hope that you join me in welcoming Kayla Barnes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to to talk with you and see where this leads us. I know it's it's fun. I always we've we've been chatting and having conversations for a long time. I think it's possible that we're coming up on a year of knowing each other at this point. I know. I don't know when the exact like year, one year anniversary, friend anniversary, whatever you call it is. It but. might be March. I think my so I think I was with my dad and my mom the the same day that you and I kind of like had our first Zoom conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, he had a medical procedure um, done, and I, I spent the day with my mom. It might have been in March. I don't know. Yeah, you'd know better. Maybe. It's very, <laughs> very possible that we're already maybe even past, past that point. Um, but the, the reason that you and I had initially connected about everything is, is you, are, you are a trainer, you're a coach, but the, the great thing that you do is you also talk about the nutrition side of things which you know even better than I, how important nutrition is for people, for their fitness, for their journey um, when it comes to movement. But I want to take it way back. And you have an interesting relationship both, both with nutrition and with movement in the ways that you were limited in moving, uh, in the ways how you handle nutrition. We'll first start with, with the movement part. We'll, we'll work our way into uh, ev everything about your relationship with food and all that. Uh, but let's let's dive right on in and let's talk about something I didn't know for a while, even though you were trainers, that you you had a back surgery. Spoiler alert for those of you that don't know. Uh, but can you walk us through a little bit of, of kind of how that all developed? Yeah, so it was a, you know, normal screening in middle school um, by our gym teacher. And, and that was something that was happening. I don't know if they still do that or not, um, but I was you know, taken out of class for a bit to be spoken with it, another doctor that did another screening and basically confirmed what the teacher had saw. And then for, I, so I was in middle school at that point, I had the surgery when I was 16. So probably over the next three years, I was seeing a doctor every six months or so and getting a new set of x-rays. Um, and that just became normal procedure for me. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I had to take all my jewelry off and everything because um, you can't have that in the in the x-ray or I had MRIs, I feel like once a year, which was awful because you can't move here in this little chamber and it's cold, it's freezing and you just hear this clanging the whole entire time, right? Even though they try to pump in music for you. Um, but anyway, so I, I guess I didn't even really realize what was causing the curvature. I was very distant from that, or maybe I just didn't really recognize the impact that it was having or could have on my body. It seemed like everybody else around me was so concerned about my well-being or how I was going to turn up when I got older. And, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm just a kid. I'm just living, you know, I'm in a little bit of pain. It's a little bit of an inconvenience, but I just, I didn't really understand. Um, and that severity was, you know, presented to me very harshly um, in the fact of you have to have surgery. And I was 16 and 
that was like, that was scary. I think I, I knew of one other person in my life ever that had the same surgery that I was about to have. And it was just like, this is, this is crazy. How did I, how did this happen to me? The kind of thing, I guess, was my initial response when I was that age. Um, and again, I still don't feel like the severity of the situation hit me until I was sitting in that little room, like with all the other, you know, um, what's the word people that are going to have surgeries, right? Patients or whatever. And this person comes up to me and goes, Kayla, I just want to share this with you. I don't want to scare you. I don't want to alarm you or anything, but we have to, you know, be upfront and honest with you. You could die today. And I'm just like, oh, way, way to just rip the bandaid off, you know, just like, hey, you could possibly die. Are you okay with that? And I'm like, well, let's please do I'm like this. Please do the best that you can. <laughs> you know? Um, so that was interesting. Um so I was in the hospital for a week just because of complications, um, which were just minor, but you know they wanted to make sure that I was safe and healthy to be able to leave. And then I was homeschooled for six weeks, which was another ordeal. And then when I got back into school, that was kind of odd and strange as well. I felt like um, I felt like a carousel horse. Like I had this thing pulling me up. I had this like pole in my body holding me up. I felt very top heavy. I felt like I could just kind of like fall over. Um, I couldn't turn my body. So if I wanted to look over there, like I had to turn, like I had to physically turn, I couldn't just like turn my head or my neck, uh, which was very odd. And then it just kind of, I guess it, there became a point where I, I got better. I forgot about it. And I just started living my life again you know, and it's just now a normal part of me that I, I sometimes think about. Um, but more often than not, I guess I don't really. And then I don't really allow it to affect me in a way of a lot, like preventing me from doing things that I want to do. Now, obviously there are some things I can't do. I can't jump out of an airplane. Darn it. Um, I can't, I probably shouldn't go bungee jumping. <sighs> Shit. I really wanted to do that, you know, but, um, other than that, like I still work out. I did Olympic lifting. And I, I found a way to still be able to move my body. Um, and it's amazing. I've seen other women specifically who have had a surgery such as mine that are more flexible, more mobile in their spine than I am, stronger in their body than I am. And I'm just like, wow, that that's my inspiration to continue doing what I'm doing with my own body. Like that's capable, they're capable of doing that. That's what's possible. That's amazing. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and also you've been, you practiced handstands afterwards mm -hmm. uh, with all sorts of things, which some people they'll just go, Nope, can't do it. I had back surgery. I, I could never even fathom doing any of that. And it's, I think, and this is something I've seen even as a physical therapist is so many times people have surgery and all of a sudden they feel like, oh no, it's this brittle thing that's going to just break and, and that's it. And their, their life and their movement is, is almost completely gone in that sense. And it's just not true. Some of those, some of those things are so incredibly durable. Um, if anything, like a, a knee replacement, that, that's the one where people always go, oh my goodness, I'm so afraid I'm going to break it. I'm like, it's metal. It's yeah. you're, you're going to break yourself before you break that thing, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, so and it's it, a lot of times you even hear those things and people get surprised after surgery. I don't know if you remember this part or not, but usually um, they'll have you walking either that that very same day, just a couple hours afterwards. Granted, please, people understand you are probably hyped up on pain medication at that point to be able to do that walking. But still, a lot of times that's what they check and they, they, they make sure we had another uh, guest on the podcast who had two uh, back surgeries within 24 hours and he was walking uh, during, during that whole time. He's had to deal with chronic back pain and that's a, it, he has a very interesting story, but, uh, but then also things turn out like they did for you, which is awesome. And now you're doing a lot of these different exercises. This is something that I love asking people who also train other people for you personally, what do you think is your favorite exercise for yourself that you're like, I love doing this. I love the way it feels for my body. This feels like a fun exercise for me personally. For me, 
deadlift. I love deadlifting. Um, I just think it's so empowering, especially as a woman who for a very long time was told not to be in the space that I'm in to be able to then lift the weight that I lift. Um, it's not like I lift extremely large amounts of weight, but it's just still like empowering to know, wow, I'm capable of doing that. Um, and I don't think I mentioned what actually caused the scoliosis. So there was an extra vertebrae um, that didn't properly align along my spine and it kind of stuck out. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, another fun fact, I have an extra floating rib. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a floating rib is before you're like, you have a rib floating in your body. So the vast majority, right. The vast majority of our ribs attach in the front to our sternum and the floating ribs are the ones that don't completely make it all, all the way around. They're the bottom portion of your ribs, the bottom part of, of your rib cage. So yeah. don't freak out. Kayla does not have a rib floating in her bloodstream. That's not what that, that means yeah. by any means, but that's very interesting. Um, do you feel like that's caused any complications or any issues for you or just, nope, it's there. It's been there yep. my whole life. Yep. It's, it's just an extra little thing. My, so my grandmother uh, and I were very close. She was my best friend. That's where I get my red hair. And she always joked to me that I stole her rib because she was born with one less floating rib. And I was born with one extra floating rib. So it, that's like, you know, our, our link together our hair and, and the rib. That's amazing. I've never heard that, that being a link. That's, that's fantastic. So, uh, because we, we have to finish off the, the equation, um, you love deadlifts. Yes. What is the exercise that you, you hate, you know, it's good for you. You may know that you should do it, but you just dread doing it every single time. Um, oh, lunges. Lunges. Okay. I, yeah. I hate lunges. <laughs> Like, I know that they're so good. Like, they are so good. And I don't know, I'm losing my voice now. <clears throat> um, they're so good, but I just, ugh, I hate them. But like in the best way possible, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think my clients dislike lunges just as much as I do. So I think the, the feeling's mutual. So since you work with clients who also dislike lunges, um, for you personally, but then maybe if you've had to walk clients through a similar mindset, what is your mindset around getting after the lunges? I know there's a part of just, I just got to get it done. Are there, is there any trick that you personally like to use of like, let me just count half of the reps. And then I'm like, oh, then I can just do the other half. And it, I break it up. That's, that's what I do. If I have to do 16, I go just do eight and then do eight more. And that, and that seems to help, even though I hate, I also don't really like lunges. They're not my most dreaded exercise, but I don't, I don't like them, <laughs> but I get it. Do you use any tricks like that? I think the more that I wait, the more that I'm going to provide that space in between, you know, the exercise and me actually doing it and putting that thought in my head of, oh, I hate this. This is awful. Like just all those negative words that I could be using. And instead I'm just like, you know, I just got to go. I just got to go. I just got to do it. You know, maybe I like take a big, huge breath or something. Maybe I just let out like a really quick breath. Um, and then I just kind of, I just have to, I just have to move. I just have to go as, as much as it sucks. If the longer I wait and the slower I go, the, the harder it is and just harder mentally it is for me to want to complete that exercise. That's, that's fantastic. I think that's great. I, that, that is also something that I always find for myself, uh, for even just starting the workout that sometimes I just need to start the warm up and just start just moving my body a little bit. And then within five minutes, it's not as bad as you thought it was. Yeah. And usually most of the time when you're done with the lunges, they may have sucked, but they're not, they weren't like the end of all ends. Um, you know, you got through them, you got better and you're going to have to do them next week. Um, it's, <laughs> they're going to come back. They just wear me out. <clears throat> Excuse me. They just, they just wear me out. Like my, I feel like my quads get fatigued very quickly and they just, they just wear me out. And I, and I think there was a point in time where I was doing them a lot, where it was causing pain in my hips. So maybe there's a little of that in there, um, you know, mus muscle memory or visceral memory of like, oh, if I do this a lot, I'm going to experience pain. But then afterwards, I'm just, you know, it's a cardio, it's a cardio workout for me. I'm just like breathing very heavy. I feel like I'm going to die. I feel like people look at me like I'm crazy. <sighs> So, 
where do you feel like you've gotten this this kind of this passion and continuous love for uh, for working out for movement? that because a lot of times people don't get it like you and I we we both enjoy exercising and there are plenty of people out there that go I don't understand why you like it so much how did that cultivate in you I think it, you know like I said for the deadlift I think it's just it's an empowering activity to be able to do um especially for a woman you know uh, in my position I think it's just so uplifting and just encouraging to be able to be like I'm you know, five, I'm five, six and a half. I don't know how much I weigh. So don't even ask. Um, like, honestly, I have no idea. Um, but like, I'm this, you know, so I've been relatively small my entire life. So to be considered that to be looked as that, and then to be able to show not just other people, but to myself, I can lift this, I can do heavy thing, I can lift heavy things, I can do hard things like I am capable. And I can overcome basically anything that comes my way. Like, it's just another opportunity for me to be able to prove to myself or to show myself that I am strong, that I am capable. That's, that's fantastic. I, I love it. But, and in, in a way you have just transitioned us so perfectly because I'm sure there are some people out there that went a trainer that doesn't know how much she weighs. Now, how, how interesting is that and how different is that? But in a way that, that is your approach. And it is, it is a beautiful approach for it. Um, can we, before we spoil why specifically you do it now, can we dial all the way back and talk a little about your journey and why you ended up going to that point and now why that's kind of what you try to pursue with clients a little bit more and not only have it be about the weight and about just numbers all the time? Yeah, well, um, so for me, I'm, I'm going to take it back, like way back for just a hot second, then I'll reel it in, I promise. <laughs> uh, so as a kid, I was very small. I was very tiny. I was called skinny mini for a very long time. There was even a point in time where doctors were worried that I had an eating disorder, more so anorexia, because I stayed the same weight uh, for like three, four years. I was, I think, no more than 80 pounds for a really, really long time. And they were like, questioning my mom, making sure like, are you feeding her? Is she being fed? Does she have a mound, like, is she malnourished in some way? Does she have a deficiency in something? They thought I was anemic, which is the, you know, deficiency of iron. And I'm like, <laughs> no, honey, I eat. You want to see how I eat? I eat. Believe me, I am not going starving. I promise you. Okay. And so like, I, even though I felt comfortable in my body and my body weight and the way I guess like never really impacted me until maybe like middle school, all throughout elementary school, I was fine. I felt comfortable in my body. It wasn't a thing. And then middle school happens and girls are starting to develop. I don't look exactly like them. So now I'm self-conscious, but I just, I felt like I couldn't win. I was too skinny. I didn't have curves. I just couldn't fit in. And then it's, oh, now abs are in or muscles are in. And it's like, well, I don't have that. So now I need to get that. Even though I was still small, I was made to feel as though I wasn't enough because I didn't look that way. Um, also, I've gone through, you know, fluctuations in my weight, um, I think, since college and learning how to have that better relationship with food. Um, did you? Do you want me to wait to talk about? No, go for it. Tell so, um, yeah. So, I mean, then I got into fitness. I found fitness. I felt like I was learning more about like how my body responded to certain foods. I was learning more about food and how it functions in the body. And this is even after college, even after I took like a nutrition class, because they just touch the, the top, you know, they skim the top. But um, no, I just started learning more about my body. I then realized uh, after a, a pretty challenging breakup that food also was comforting to me, like it is a lot of people. And I ended up starting binge eating. And at the time, I don't think I really realized what it was. It was more controlled, mm -hmm. um, very specific situations. And then it just got to a point where it was out of control. But again, I don't think I really realized what it was. I then started a diet program that my gym was promoting, and that's a whole nother story. Um, <clears throat> but I was very restricted 
and the foods that I could eat, I was almost, I feel like brainwashed to believe certain things about my food and the way that it impacted my body and why I couldn't have certain things. And so my list of foods once was, you know, this plethora became like something like this. And so any moment that I had experience of like anxiety or stress, I started binging. And so then I've gone through binge eating recovery. I'm still in binge eating recovery. And so when I started my own business, um, I realized that a lot of other women were struggling with the same thing. And through my binge eating recovery, it's kind of like, if, do you want to recover or do you want to lose weight? And so putting the emphasis on our weight is not healthy and it's almost detrimental to binge eating recovery. So that's kind of like the long explanation for why I'm where I am right now. Um, and because I want to be able to get back to that place of before when I was a child where I was happy, comfortable in my body. I didn't really care what I weighed that, you know, I felt good. I was able to move and play in a way that felt good for me. And I was able to eat in a way that felt good to me. And I was happy with it. And I feel like I'm slowly getting back to that place. I think w one thing you touched on at, at sort of the beginning of that story that that is important and that can apply to literally anyone is that that piece of being enough. Um, whatever, whatever that may look like in any person's life, it's that little piece that you said, I'm not enough for, for whatever it is, be it muscles, be it curves, be it the weight that I'm supposed to, uh, supposed to meet. And, um, I know the story, but can you give us a little more actually about, uh, we, don't, we don't need to know the names of the gym or any of those things necessarily, but can you tell us that story? Because I think it shows it in a way of, uh, how much these pressures can come in and how they stack up slowly. But then all of a sudden you find yourself in almost like a shit storm of like, wait, how did I necessarily get there? And I, I am kind of, I'm talking about uh, the, the promotion of that diet program from the gym and sort of the pressures that were there on you. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So I knew that, well, I was already kind of uncomfortable and not so happy in my body at that point. Again, I had, I had gone through a breakup and then I immediately got into another relationship I lost 15 pounds because I was so anxious the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. But then when I broke up with him, I ended up eating everything. And so then I started slowly gaining that weight back. And I had tried the, even though I help guide other people, it's still a struggle. It's still challenging. And I tried all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. And I was still struggling. And my, at the time, the gym that I was working for, my fitness director had brought in a consultant and he had a nutrition company that he was curating and trying to also introduce to other gyms and, and to get on the map and to help people. And the way that it was presented to me initially, now I did have my feelers up. I was like, mm, I don't know about this, you know, but as I continued to speak with this person and I was introduced to the program there's like all of these educational scientific videos that you're to watch that explain their philosophy and to someone who might not know it sounds really good Ian and it got me too because it sounded so good and so amazing and the idea was this is the last diet that you're ever going to go on this is a lifestyle this is a learning experience. This is going to help people, you know, and with that, if I did the program because I was skeptical and they wanted me to do the program, they also wanted me to be a promotion or a promoter of the product that then I would take control of any client that came into the gym that wanted to lose weight and use that program. I was their touch point. I was their coach, their counselor. Um, so I needed to know all the ins and outs, the, you know, tr the, um, oh, what's the word? Troubleshooting. There you go. <laughs> Blonde. Um, <laughs> uh, so like the, I needed to know all the ins and outs, all the workings of the program so that I would be able to help encourage the people. And plus it helps if you're getting advice from someone who knows the program and knows and has been through it. Right. So <clears throat> I was told if I did well, then I could make a lot of money. 
I was also told then that I would be a bigger portion and a bigger role in the company and in the program itself. So it sounded really great. It sounded like it aligned with what I wanted to achieve. Yes, I wanted to make more money at the time I was trying to buy a house. So this person knew that I was in financial scarcity. He knew that I was aligned deeply to helping women um, you know, lose weight, feel better in their body. I was very into holistic health and, you know, eating certain, certain foods to reduce inflammation and that sort of thing. So he just was able to lean into those things and push all of my buttons to get me to say yes. Mm. So I started this program and it was very public. He wanted it to be very publicized. So the platform, you can invite family, friends, coworkers, or whatever to watch your progress. And so every day you had to fill out a questionnaire and you had to answer the questions honestly. And it kind of gave you a idea of if you do all of the right things every single day, like there was 21 things that you had or 22 things that you had to do every single day to ensure your success. And the most, if you could do the most of them every day, then your success would be heightened, right? So you had this questionnaire, you had to weigh yourself every single day. I then, <laughs> I'd get so upset with myself if in the morning I didn't go number two, because then I knew that the number on the scale was going to be higher than it was supposed to. And that became a whole thing. Like I'd get so upset with myself and know that I was failing. I wasn't succeeding. I was being an awful example. And so during, while I'm in this program, you know, I have all this pressure on me. It's very public. I'm, I have all my clients watching me. I have members of the gym watching me. Um, I have this, oh, you'll make lots of money on, on it because I, you know, I wanted to get out of that financial um, scarcity. And so I started binging. And for those that don't know what binge eating is, what they think that it is might not be exactly what it is. So you have to be clinically diagnosed to be considered a binge, to have binge eating disorder. Um, and I think it's, now don't, don't 100% quote me, but I think it's like three times or more a month that you have a binge episode considers you a binge eater. Now a binge episode is eating large amounts of food in a short period of time. And you feel this overwhelming feeling of compulsion, this strong, compelling feeling to continue to eat, even to the point of feeling so sick that you still don't stop, that you still continue to eat. Um, so if you just had like one Ben and Jerry's pint and you think that that's like binging, honey, that's, that's not even half the binge. That's one part of it. Like, um, so I, I started doing that almost every single night for like, I don't know, six to nine months or so. And I was fighting this binge urge, hiding it from people. And then also I was trying to be a good example for, for others and to sell this program. I did end up getting to be the leanest that I've ever been. I was 126 and I think I started at 153. And I lost, so I lost 30 pounds in three months, which is insane, yeah. more than 30 pounds. Um, and I, I, so there were complications. I started binging and then I also lost my period because of it. So lots and lots of things happened because of that diet. Wow. I mean, there's, there's so much to, to even think about and unpack there. I think the, the first thing that really struck me is the fact that there are 22 things you have to do every single day, which that's that's challenging that's doing five new things that you almost have to start an, a, a new habit even if it's as small as drinking a glass of water that's mm -hmm. still something that doing that every single day like say that's the first thing you do in the morning that can be challenging for people doing yeah. 22 that's already a huge amount of pressure understandable yeah. you were trying to hold on to that because you have all these people watching you and Mm -hmm. Yes, that that definitely provides some amount of, of support, but I don't know if that's if that's necessarily the right kind of support. So from from all of that, I I think there are plenty of people out there. I know I for sure can think of several times that I've encountered that kind of mentality of that's the way, that's the only way, and that's how you need to approach it is just an all or nothing almost mentality mm -hmm. of, of just diving completely in. 
Yeah. And that's, that's not the way the, the easiest way that I usually tell people that's not the way is I'm like, you didn't get here by an all or nothing mentality. You didn't start saying, I'm going to do 22 things every single day to make my health terrible and, and just do the awful things um, that my body doesn't necessarily want uh, me, me to do. So it, it didn't get there overnight and you're not going to fix it that way um, either uh, in that sense there's, there's just so much in that story. Thank you for, for sharing all of that, because I mean, I, I think it's very important for many, many out there. So you went through that. Um, you, you said yourself, it's kind of st still in that recovery sense and that it's, it's recovery over just a number of weight mm -hmm. of how much it is. So now that you're talking to clients, how do you feel sometimes that you approach and you kind of maneuver around this idea of if they're saying I need to lose weight, but you can very much tell that there's possibly some disordered eating and, and, and how you kind of guide them through making that decision of maybe it's not always about the number or maybe you specifically shouldn't talk about the number to them. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I'm also clear. I'm not a registered dietitian and I'm not as like, I'm not a therapist that works with specifically eating disorder patients. I'm not a therapist at all. I just work with those women because I resonate with them because I've been there as well. Um, and I would most like, if it's a, outside of my pay grade, if it's outside of my, my wheelhouse or scope of practice, I will always send people out. The first thing that I always want to make sure that we're doing is we're uncovering a really strong understanding of why that person wants to achieve whatever goal that it is. So I don't, I, even if they came to me and they said, Kayla, I really need to lose 30 pounds by, I don't know, August at this point, right? And that's three months away. That's really not as um, it's not something that I would encourage someone to try and do. It's a very short period of time. And that would mean that even if, even if, you know, we, we could do that, that, but we would have to have everything in line. Their hormones would be intact. They don't already have to have a good, like activity uh, level. They're already putting in the small baby steps that have created a, a strong foundation for them. So I would never, I don't want to ever discourage them, but I also want to just understand why, why is it that this goal is important to you? And then, you know, digging deeper, what do we think that that 30 pounds is going to give you more confidence in yourself or, or whatever it is, more movement, more play time with your children, you know, to be able to go and buy clothes and have a better experience. So it's not really the number on the scale, it's everything else that's going to come with it. So how can we focus more intent intentionally on the other benefits that come with it and not just so much focusing on the number on the scale. And I'm open and honest with them as well. I have no reason to hide or not share any of these things. But like, even when I was at my leanest, I was still not happy. <laughs> I was still not happy with what I saw in the mirror. I still was not happy with what I, like how I felt in my body. And I was still not able to please all the people in my life. You know, I felt like, again, I was getting these comments of you look sick or you're not, you don't look healthy or you've lost now the curves that you had, like, like you, just, you couldn't, we couldn't win. So instead, how can we focus on the benefits of how health, like how our health is, our improved health is going to impact us? Um, so I think, I think I answered your question. You very much did. I, I hope everybody out there was listening to the specific thing that she said of not being happy when she was skinny, that goal. I, I know there might be some people out there that are going, you know, like 126. I would be over the moon. Would you? Is that really what would happen? You can't, you can't necessarily know and you can't know either way. And I, I think that there are plenty of people out there that say we need to be happy in the moment and we need to accept this. And that this is all just, uh, just a part of the journey. It is not necessarily that you need to say, oh, I am, I am, you know, like clinically overweight or obese where that is detrimental to my cardiovascular system. I'm happy in this moment. You can be happy and still kind of clinically and medically be like, eh, probably need to lose weight for your health, for your yeah. happiness. That is a completely different discussion. And most likely you're always going to be chasing that part. I personally know that as well, because I'm constantly working out and thinking that I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I, I, I need to be losing more and more weight. And people around me keep on being like, you need to put on some weight. You're like way too skinny. Like, this is a problem. And I'm over here in my head being like, no, you guys don't understand. You don't know. And yeah, it's finding the internal happiness of going, no, you're okay. You're enough. 
yeah it's it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be all right so thank you for sharing that um if nobody else i at least gained gained a good a good amount um from all of that uh to lighten it up a little bit, I, I want to say that you post a lot of stuff on Instagram, um, a lot of fantastic things on Instagram, okay. and you like to have fun with it. You like to put your personality out there. Um, even, even though there may be some older things about your love for Disney, you've still put it out with new things and new posts about Disney princess personalities and what they may say about you and, and working out and then superheroes and all of that. I think that's that's really wonderful, and it's it's bringing in that play. It's bringing in, in a way, it's bringing in that why that you're saying, but it's bringing in your why. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what what is your kind of driving passion about why you really like doing that and expressing yourself and helping women? Yeah, another loaded question. <laughs> um, so part part my my why I feel like is kind of it's kind of all over the place. So. I remember I shared with you my grandmother um, who I got my red hair from and I have her rib. Um, she was my absolute best friend. When I was a teenager, uh, like middle school, high school, we would go to movies all the time together during the summer. We would spend a lot of time together. And even when I was in college, like she, I forget how old she was, but she was texting. We were texting each other all the time and sending each other pictures and stuff like she she was my best friend and it's unfortunate but it's true she passed away from complications from a lot of medications that i feel were probably unnecessary and could have been dealt with in different ways with habit and diet change and lifestyle changes and so that has always been a driving force Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be that person. If I can help it to the best of my ability, I don't want to have to be on medications. And I just, that's not the way that I want to live my life. So that's, that's a huge driving force for me. Um, the other driving force for me is I think the experiences that I've had just as being a woman in this space and how can I help other women feel more comfortable and confident and how can I give them, how can I empower them with knowledge and information and the support that they can achieve their goals and that they can feel comfortable in, in the gym setting or in any setting of their life. It, the gym is just one aspect. It's one place. That's not where we live our life, but how can we bring that confidence that we cultivate in that space and how can it bleed everywhere else? Um, and then also my struggles with my body image and the way that I view myself and my relationship with myself and my relationship with food has impacted the way that I coach and train my clients as well. Because like I said, there, this is something that we don't normally talk about a lot. Um, it's still, I think, very faux pas. Like, you know, we just don't talk about it. Um, and it really is disheartening because so many women are struggling with this and I don't and again I just don't want to be a 60 70 80 90 year old lady <laughs> that is uncomfortable in her body that's still saying those nasty negative mind like things about herself and so you know my main like my, my I would love to be able to get to women as young as possible to be able to help mold them so that they can just cut years off of their life of hating themselves <laughs> so that they can just step into their true authentic selves younger and, and stronger and more beautiful as they continue to grow. Because I just would, I don't want to be discomfort. I don't want to be uncomfortable and look back and feel regretful or disgusted at my body or myself or my capabilities when I'm older. Uh, well said, so well said. And I think that there's, um, there's an unfortunate reality around the fitness industry of where we are presented with very unrealistic expectations of, I, I have, um, I have since stopped doing this, but I have sometimes gotten onto people when they put Instagram stories or reels up and they're just like, 
just do this exercise to get six pack abs like mine. And I'm like, no, that's not how you get, that's not it. This little circuit is not what gets you six pack abs, but that's the thing that's constantly there. And it's like, just, you know, eat 300 grams of protein a day. And you're just going, these are the things that are being pushed forward sometimes. And you're going, this isn't, this is not the reality. And also this is not necessarily what we need to be trying to achieve all the way and, and push for. And that's just, that, that's the way that it is. And also the kind of like that negative talk. I just heard a statistic of where anything that you say uh, neurochemically has 10%, uh, 10 times more of an impact on you than, than your actual thought. Mm -hmm. A negative thought has three to four times more impact than a positive thought. So if your thoughts are constantly, I am overweight, I suck, I'm not strong enough, I can't control myself. If those are the things you're thinking, you're just further and further reinforcing. And then if you're saying that out loud, if you're going like you get a plate of fries and you're going, I just can't help myself, you're further reinforcing all of those things. And so it's this interesting thought of we need to get away from that. We need to accept ourselves where we are, kind of with, with, with what you're saying. And let's talk about the deeper why. Let's talk about the good positive things that are going to come out of this and come out of this journey and this process. Um, so I, I, I really, I really enjoyed that. I, I think you have so many wonderful stories. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm so glad that you were able to share them with everybody. I mentioned Instagram and I know that you have a lot of stuff on Instagram, but if people really want to get in touch with you and connect with you, what's the best place? Where should people go to find you? Facebook um, at Kayla Barnes, uh, K-A-Y-L-A-B-A-R-N-E-S. Uh, if you see a girl in a purple shirt, that's me. Um, <laughs> um, doing a little, little flexi flex. Um, and then on Instagram, it's the same picture. And it's at Kayla Marie, which is my middle name, and then fit, Kayla Marie fit. Um, and you can send me a DM and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Guys, you know, we, I love purple. So that's always been a fun little extra for me that she's got purple in her profile pictures. Um, but all of those links are going to be down below. Kayla, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I know that that might have been tough, but there are many people out there that really, really appreciate it. Thanks for being yeah. on. There, I think there's strength in being able to tell your story and the only like if I weren't if I just were to keep it to myself I'm not helping anybody um, and I think we just have to keep working on breaking down you know little by little diet culture and the things that diet culture tells us we have to work on loving ourselves for who we are at any shape size condition um, because that's the only way that we're going to be able to then be happy in our surroundings and in our situations, we have to be able to love ourselves first. And I think that's where a lot of people get things wrong. Oh, when I lose weight is when I love myself. Mm -mm, honey, you have to love yourself as you are now. And loving yourself as you are now doesn't mean, oh, I can just give up. I can keep eating the way that I'm eating. I can get fat or, or obese or have all these diseases. But loving yourself now means I'm going to do what's necessary for me to have the best possible life tomorrow. And I'm going to do those things today. Um, so I know we had talked about that before. I really wanted to make sure that people knew the difference between what that kind of means. Um, and just keep telling my story and helping as many women as I can step into their, you know, their true and authentic selves. How can they continue to show up for themselves and how can we make fitness fun? How can we make health and wellness you know, something that we integrate into all aspects of our life. And it's not just so segmented of working out or gym life and that sort of thing. I love it. And I think something that you touched on is, is the, the stories part. Feel free to reach out to me. I'll have my links down below. If you have any stories that you want to share, go ahead and, and let us, let us know, like, it's always a treat when we get to hear that we impacted your story in the, some sort of way. Um, I, I, I know that's true. And, and it's never a bother. It helps a lot more people than you think to share your story, uh, just like Kayla said. And uh, uh, so thank you also, Kayla, very much for that last part, because that is totally going to be cut out and used as a little soundbite clip <laughs> from this episode, because that was beautifully said. Oh, good. Uh, awesome. <laughs> uh, but on that, as always, guys, until next time. Bye. 
I hope you found that episode insightful, but for me personally, and this actually comes from a little bit of a before the episode interview that I had with Kayla, we talked about this idea of recovering, that there is, there is a piece of it that we think that we may have completely recovered from something. And this is something that I battle with constantly of thinking, yes, I've overcome this thought pattern around sometimes even food for myself because I don't have the best of eating habits, even though I eat very clean from what I think and I can be very regimented. It doesn't mean that my relationship with food is necessarily very good. But we think that we've recovered, but actually we're still in that recovering process. And it is a constant journey, a constant, constant journey. So I hope that you've had some other takeaways. And as always, until next time.